People always ask, if I could only have one rifle, what would it be? But everyone knows there's no such thing as just one rifle. The better question is, what two would you pick? What two rifles would I own and what accessories would I have that support and benefit each other? So for example, I have here an 18 inch with a suppressor and I have an 11.5 with a suppressor. And, and as you can tell, this one has a LPVO or mid-range MPVO and then a red dot and a magnifier. Now, before we get going too far into the details of these builds and what I would do in order to have guns that complement each other, we have to thank American Pipe Dream Apparel. Those chads are out there selling Flectarn, camping gear, even some hand tools. So thank you very much American Pipe Dream Apparel for sponsoring this video and also we can't forget Patreon. Our Patreon members are also chads and they are helping us financially. Dude, I just said chad twice. I'm definitely on an FBI watch list. So back to the topic at hand. Okay, so we're looking at two different rifle builds that still shoot the same caliber, but I have them set up in a way to benefit and offset each other. Diversity, we'll throw that word in there for you too. So for example, this 18 inch with a Criterion barrel is a pretty solid rifle in regards to not necessarily precision because 5.56 can only be so much of a precision round depending on the ammo that you're talking about. But the fact that it has a one in eight twist, a good suppressor that is dedicated to the gun, a really high quality optic, a Leupold Mark V HD. This is a 3.6 to 18 and that's a lot of optic. You may wanna consider something like a one to six with a Delta Point Pro mounted on top, or maybe not even at all. You could just run this as a standalone one to six. But this rifle is set up for zero to five or six or 800 yards even. Now, there are some downsides to the round of 5.56, five, but I am getting as much capability as I can while still staying somewhat compact. Now, this rifle is 26 inches, something like that, with the suppressor, maybe a little bit shorter, maybe more like 25 or 24. So it's a long gun. I could obviously go to a 20 inch or a 22 inch barrel and get even more muzzle velocity out of the gun. But the reason that I have this set up the way that I do, an 18 inch with a one and eight twist, is because I'm not always going to be shooting 77 grain, really high quality ammo out of this thing. This 18 inch rifle is gonna be giving me a little over 3000 feet per second at muzzle velocity. And 5.56, let's take 55 grain M193, what a lot of people are shooting, it's really only gonna fragment uh, at or above 2,700 feet per second. So as soon as we drop down below that into shorter barrels or that round is traveling at distance and it's slowing down over a period of time, that round is not gonna be nearly as devastating just because that round isn't gonna fall apart and fragment on the inside of a wound cavity. So this is not so much about precision as it is about having a higher power rifle while staying inside of the 5.56 cartridge. So if you want a good rifle that's set up for uh, versatility on, I wanna be able to shoot a deer, I wanna be able to shoot some distance, and I wanna have really good penetration, even inside of buildings or whatever it is that you're doing with this gun, this is simply a higher power rifle because it has a longer barrel. Now, okay, that makes sense for this build. I don't wanna go build another 16 inch or 14.5. I wanna have something that collapses a little bit more and gives me some space to move inside of a building or a structure or a car or just be shorter and a little bit more lightweight. Now, of course, there are some consistencies on these builds. They both have quad rails. I'm not the biggest fan of quad rails, but the reason that I have Daniel quad rails on both of these rifles is because A, they're proven and they're consistent. And then B, because of heat. I hate shooting with uh, really thin, compact handguards like not to dog BCM, but their MCMR is an awesome handguard until you put a suppressor on there. You get maybe two mags of shooting fairly quickly through the gun, and I'm always fighting for a glove. Those handguards get really hot, so having a quad rail just puts a little bit more mass between my hand and the gas block, my hand and the barrel. Okay, but back to this gun. You can tell that this has a three times magnifier on there. Now, this is an incredible tool, and I love being able to pull this off, throw it in a dump pouch, and save some weight. I can obviously pull this up to my eye and not point a gun at something if I wanna just look and observe. But in the same way, this has a one power and it can take three power. This has three to 18, but with that offset dot, it can go back to one power. So now we're starting to get into the idea that while these are different tools, they're very versatile and they can, well, 
Blake Water. Uh, I don't know if you follow him on Instagram, but Blake Water put it this way. You may have a specific build in mind to do a task, but you still need to have the ability to fight from or to the objective, whatever lo the location is that you're doing. I'm in an urban area and I wanna be able to take shots across buildings at 300 yards, 200 yards. Yeah, but you're still gonna be in buildings. I wanna be able to move inside of a building comfortably. Yeah, but you're still gonna have to get there. So having this three times magnification means that the gun is purpose built, but still versatile. Surefire SB2, the suppressor on here is designed for shorter barrels. And I went with an 11 inch one and seven twist with a BCM BFH or cold hammer forged barrel. What the heck does that even mean? Okay, so let's touch on barrels real quick. So this is a lightweight barrel. Just because it's, it's a little bit longer, I wanna have the ability to move it around quickly. So I want to make this as light as possible. That Criterion barrel is chrome lined and the one and eight twist means that my, my rifling inside of the barrel is spread out just a little bit more. And that's to accommodate the fact that I'm not always going to be shooting a heavier bullet. It's gonna have the flexibility to shoot 55, 62, or 77 grain really well. Now this is a one in seven twist. And the reason for that is because this, as a home defense rifle, is gonna be shooting heavier rounds 90% of the time in a really bad scenario. Now I train with 55 grain and yeah, it shoots reasonably well, probably two MOA with 55 grain. But the fact that it's a tighter group accommodates the slower moving projectile for 77 grain like Mark 262 or any of those other fancy rounds. So that's the barrel, that's the loadout on here. Now one more point, why EOTech, not T2? Both are phenomenal optics. The reason that I have an EOTech on here is because it is so much better to shoot magnified. It also gives me a little bit more information when I'm shooting up close. That 68 MOA circle tells me my height over bore right off the bat. There's no guesswork. And yes, you should be able to train and shoot off of just a standard T2 or an EOTech EXPS1 that just has a single dot. But having that dope built in underneath my, my hold up close is really nice. So benefits to both, they're both purpose built but they both also have the flexibility to do different tasks. Hope that makes sense. I'm tired of talking. Let's get to shooting. It's a little windy out here today, which kind of makes me think a lot of people, a lot of people will say the, the faster moving rounds, like, uh, that's about good. Okay, so let's say that this 18 inch shoots a 55 grain projectile at a piece of steel at hundred yards away. A lot of people will say, well, yeah, because it's moving, faster, it cuts the wind better. It's not exactly how that works. And I'm sure, I understand what they're trying to say, but here's kind of a demo for you. So let's take two rounds, 55 grain. One is fired out of an 11.5 suppressed and one's fired out of an 18 inch suppressed. How fast is that projectile? Obviously minus the brass primer and powder. How fast does that round fall? It falls at the exact same speed. Gravity is working the exact same. Wind, if it's moving eight miles an hour of wind, it's moving at the exact same pace. But, I'll have to find those in a sec, but one round is moving at a little over 3,000 feet per second at the muzzle. The other is moving at about 2,700 feet per second at the muzzle, give or take, depending on the gun, depending on the ammo. So the fact that one round is getting there quicker means that gravity is working on it at the exact same rate, but it is achieving its goal of 100 yards at a faster period of time than the slower moving projectile. So gravity is still working on it at the exact same rate, but this one got there sooner. And so that's why people are saying like, man, my 20 inch rifle shoots so flat. Yeah, not because gravity is working on it any different. It's not defeating gravity. It's not defeating wind. It's just getting there sooner. And so the amount of time where that projectile is in flight, it doesn't have as much time to affect your projectile. So that also feeds into a point that I made talking about how an 18 inch rifle is really, really, I guess deadly is a good way to put it. It's just because your projectile is moving at a faster speed that when it hits something, it's creating a bigger explosion internally on soft tissue. There's your uh, little science for the day. Okay, let's get to shooting. Nick, you might want to throw ears on there, stud. <laughs> okay. So we're at right about 100 yards, which is where this is gonna be still very competitive compared to an 18 inch with a higher power optic. 
So let's run a few drills with and without magnification on both rifles, run out on time and just see, let's try to get two hits on steel. That's a TA targets C zone at hundred yards. Oh, in the grass. That's hard to see through all that stuff. Ugh, one mic, five, eight, one, three rounds. Okay. Both good hits. Five, two, five. Okay, let's set that aside. I'm gonna try shooting off of the offset dot. It's gonna be a little brutal. Let's just see. Oh. Oh. Oh, I did not expect that to happen. 611. Okay, I'll take it. I also had to adjust. I got down. There was a ton of grass in the way. That was brutal. Yeah, I'm going to be sneezing any minute here, laying in the grass. Okay, let's try it with this optic. Okay, yeah, so they're pretty competitive on time. Now, without a doubt, I could go back, you know what, let's do that. Let's go back another like 80 yards and just see how competitive these two still are. Let's push back some. All right, we're getting closer to two something, two and change. And I was shooting that last drill right at 3.6. So that reticle was really small and fine, front focal plane optic. But fighting through the grass, it's a little brutal. And getting back to some distance, I'm gonna crank it up. But obviously, if you haven't shot with a you know, magnified optic much before, the greater in magnification you go, the tighter field of view you're starting to look at. So if I'm dropping to prone and trying to find an optic really fast, the tighter you go and more magnified you are on your optic, the harder it's gonna be, if you're not perfect and precise, finding that target inside of your reticle. So I may start low, and then crank that thing up in order to get a good shot, but I'm not even gonna try to use my offset dot here. No, screw it, let's try, let's see. Oh. Was that first shot impact? Yeah. yeah, and then I just couldn't follow it up. First shot was in a 392, so dropping to prone and getting on that no magnified red dot. Oh, it's still pretty good for a C zone target at two plus. I took some extra shots. That wind is starting to push that round a little bit more. It's gonna be even worse with that 11.5. But uh, yeah, that was, it was not easy. It's doable, but I'm laying in the grass and I'm working with an optic trying to go fast. That's cool, that's a fun setup. Oh, yeah, dude. Yes, yeah, so first round impact. Uh, I'm sorry, first round was a miss. I didn't see where the round went because I didn't have any magnification, but the wind's going left to right, so I was like, I should probably just hold a little bit left, and then two hits. That was stellar. 7.37. So, the intro, we were shooting three plus, maybe close to 400 yards, and the 18 inch was crushing. I think I had one miss. Yeah, I had one miss low for starters. And then we shot like 20 rounds for the intro, crushed it. Couldn't do it with this thing, I'll, I'll be honest. I could not make that happen with that many rounds with this gun at that distance. But here we are at 200 yards. The gun is zero to 200 yards, it's very capable. The follow-up question is awesome, congratulations. What is the round doing once it gets there? And we know that the muzzle velocity is starting to fall off the map a little bit. And once I go back to three, four, 500 yards, yep, you can make hits and where you are hitting your target plays a big role, but that's why I have a couple things. Diversity in my guns, I'm trying to build them out for purpose, but if this gun was not set up without a magnifier, 
any, any more distance than this, I'm not gonna see my splash if I have a miss. And it's just gonna be harder and harder to actually be competitive in any field with a platform like this. Start moving in, this gun's really gonna shine compared to that other one. We have expended our rifle ammunition and we need to go back, but there's an m &E down at the vehicles. I don't know where I got this, this lingo. He's not dead, but he sure is scared. All right, we're at like five yards. So let's just do this purpose-built rifle, something up close and personal. And we'll do a head box. We'll go one high ready, one low ready, swap guns. Oh, I should probably load this thing, huh? Didn't catch it at all. Let's move that a little closer. How about that? Yeah, let's try that. Same spot, uh, 0.86, let's go low ready. 0.83, that can be faster. All right, 0.65. What, I did throw one of those? Okay, I'm looking for 0.65. There's no way I threw that, but I guess I did. Ah, 0.76, I adjusted one more time. I really want this. Brought it back down. All right, I'm still sub second, 0 0.8, 0 0.7. My 0.6 can be cleaned up, but there's a, there's a location where I can actually put in some work. And there's another point. So when we're all the way up on a hill, I have an optic that gives me tons of info. I mean, there's grids and the whole reticle system is designed to actually give me information before and after I shoot. I can watch a splash where I miss, go down and go this many mils, this many mils with wind, with bullet drop, all that stuff, make a perfect follow-up shot or call for someone else. And people tend to associate dope or data on previous engagement to carbines like this, something where I'm shooting far and I have data and I have my little data booklet here in my front flap where I can actually refer to this much distance is 0.6 mils. I can dial or I can hold and then make a perfect shot. Well, that's true. But here we are at five yards, and if this is my first time shooting, I may not know, or I may only know in theory, that I have a height over bore. So don't get sucked into these mindsets where dope, which is a fancy buzzword, which is still very practical, can only be applied to a certain platform. No, I'm trying to build a purpose-built platform, but still be flexible with that gun, or with that build, with that loadout, with my full kit, I have a rifle and a pistol. Dope tends to refer to one thing, but take that concept as far as shooting and being precise with my shooting to, I have data on previous experience here on a flat range, and I know that when I set up my sling this way, it allows me to transition from rifle to pistol really smoothly. When I transition from rifle to pistol, when I'm wearing a plate carrier versus just a belt, I prefer to transition this way or roll it off to the side. What are the pros and cons to those? How does that change if you add or subtract a suppressor to your gun? Because the weight that it takes, the speed that you can pull that muzzle up may change how fast or slow you can actually drive the gun. So take some of these terms that people throw out there from long range or from close quarter CQB, and then try to be cross compatible with all of your platforms, a chest rig, a plate carrier, a belt, the dot on your pistol, the dot on your rifle, the magnifier on your rifle, and then start to have an understanding of a full complete system. And again, that's where we have, I don't want just one gun, I want two guns that are complementing each other in different directions, but I can still execute the same tasks with each build. So again, let's throw a different gun on and try this and see if my times change with an offset dot. All right, let's go high ready head box. We're more like seven yards here. 109. Perfect. One flat. Let's go low ready. Oh, it was slow. I kind of had that lumbering. Whoa, it's a big gun to bring up. And then I had to bring it back down. Just takes a lot of reps, man. Dry fire is a good way to get good at this kind of thing too. Look at a light switch on a wall and just bring that gun up to it and get really comfortable bringing an optic directly to your eyes. Let's try that one more time. So that was a 0.9. Yeah, yeah, you can see that muzzle come whoop because I'm just trying to bring all this 
this length of the gun with a lot of leverage, a can up on the front, and it just kind of bounces. I gotta get strunk, more like my uh, uncle administrative results. Hey, pipe down a little bit, okay? Let's go, uh, let's go fast this time, flash sight picture. Better, 0.75. Okay, well, that crushes that head box. Let's get a little movement in and play with these uh, while our feet are moving. Dude, you know those Costco, like chicken ranch burritos mm -hmm. that uh, there's no way they're good for you and that's why they're delicious? I would murder one of those right now. A buddy of mine was telling me that you also get a Costco hot dog. You cut open the burrito thing you slip a Costco hot dog in there for some extra protein. <laughs> Dude, that sounds, like a, that sounds like a belly bomb. <laughs> Let's do three to the body, on the move, two on steel, stop in front of that, that target and go three to the body again. So three, two, three. I didn't really see that, that pistol coming into play, but it brings up a good point slings and how you set up your gun people may set up a rifle that's uh okay so let's say that this is set up for hiking because it's a it's an spr i'm going to be shooting distance i'm going to be rucking with it sure okay great yeah i agree that you should purpose build a rifle to a degree but if you set something up in a way where you still can't transition from rifle to pistol because your sling ties you up or at least let's say that's not how you practice on the flat range you have a 10-3 or an 11-3 that you transition from rifle to pistol with, like on my Mark 18-ish build, and your sling is set up to be really comfortable while shooting and moving in close, close quarters, but you can't do the same with this, just be aware of it and maybe take some time, go to the flat range and figure out how you can set something up to be more comfortable with it. I may decide that, hey, I've been shooting this for a while, I, I do want to move this sling back here, and then I wanna bring this a little bit closer, and it's not as comfortable when I am shooting and moving, or maybe I wanna have different QD points built into the gun so that I can move it around on the fly. Maybe I just run this around my neck. Going back to the whole dope idea, take that concept, now start applying it to all of your kit and gear. I have data on previous experience or engagements. And I have concluded that when I have a plate carrier and I transition from rifle to pistol, the gun is doing, you get what I'm getting at. But I need to run a few more drills and uh, get some reps with this thing as well as that shorty gun. All right, guys, if I could leave you with two points, they would be this. Number one, whatever gun you have right now or guns you have right now, purpose build them in a way that they're still flexible. And point number two is it doesn't matter what you have if you suck with it. So make sure that you're dry firing, getting to the range, getting reps, and becoming more proficient and aware of how this gun works. Now, if you spend all your money on multiple guns and you don't have the required minimum of a thousand rounds per gun, so if I have two, two rifles in 5.56, I should have 2,000 rounds of 5.56 on standby that's stockpiled, and 10 magazines per rifle. That's just my bare minimum. You need to pick and choose what works for you, but if you're spending that kind of money on a rifle, you should be budgeting that kind of money for ammo as well, and then you're gonna have to spend even more for training because yes, it is crucially important. Now, you're also gonna have to spend some money on batteries, accessories like gas rings and bolts to keep these items up and running and functional. But uh, once you shoot a little bit, you'll start to see how fast you blow through batteries, how often you have to clean, and what it takes to keep these rifles really up and running. Now I got one more point that I gotta make, and then uh, we should be done. Nick, come on. Everyone wants to know how to build community, so let me give you a little point on self-reflection. If you're one of those guys that has a short gun with a muzzle brake on it, and you don't have a suppressor, you can go shoot with just about anyone, and they're gonna make sure that they're not your friend. So. You don't have a suppressor, please don't have a muzzle brake on your gun. Now getting away with an 18 inch or 16 inch with a brake may be possible, but a shorty like this 11.5 or 10.5 should not have a brake. You ride? No, it's okay. Me and my friend got it. Okay, I'll see, so. you. see you later. <laughs>